Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click. Get flexible payment options. Then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Hemp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. We're two passionate movie lovers who love talking about movies passionately. Welcome to the next reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. Identity is over. It's time to talk about Timmy. There was a storm. It was an accident. We had an accident. And we got stuck and we couldn't get out. We couldn't get out because of the storm. It's flooded. It's a dead end. You the manager? Officer Rose. Transporting a prisoner here. But the roads are all flooded and I could use a room. I don't think we can get out tonight. I'm not staying here. Are you out of your mind? There is no place else to go. What happened to the motel? People started dying. Andy, have you heard about these membership plans we have over at the Next Reel? Membership plans? Tell me more. For just $1 a month, that's practically nothing. 
you can become a One Reeler member and get access to member channels over on Discord. But I'm already a member on Discord. Yeah, but you don't have access to the special channels. Ooh, so what's on these special member-only channels? You know that Saturday matinee show? Oh, yeah, the one I get every Monday when the hosts talk about news and trailers, play movie-related games, and then they challenge each other with their lists of films related somehow to the movie that we reviewed that week? That's the one. Members get access to the Show Talk channel where they can vote on these lists each week. Wait, wait, wait. You, you mean there's a vote? I, I love voting. Mama always said, vote early and vote often. Now, if you bump your membership to the two-reeler tier, which costs a measly $5 a month, practically the same you'd pay for a fancy coffee drink, you get so much more. Oh, uh, what more is there? Two-reelers not only get everything the one-reelers get... <laughs> That's a given. ...but they also get access to live streams to watch the shows when they actually record, or any time thereafter. You mean I have to stop doing this in my bathrobe? Two reelers also get to be a part of the pre-show chat with hosts before every film board episode. I like it. I like it. Two reelers get every show before regular listeners and without ads. Oh, you mean they don't have to sit through this? <laughs> Count me in. But the best benefit of all, members get bonus member-only episodes. I love that. It's an exciting time to be alive. What can I say? So how do I sign up? It's easy. Just head to thenextreel.com slash membership. Thenextreel.com slash membership? Thenextreel.com slash membership. Access to member-only channels in Discord, early access to shows, access to live streams, and member bonus episodes. Sign up today. Andy! Spoiled rotten. Wait, spoiled? Rotten. No, it's actually spoiled. Period. Rotten? Question mark. It is? I thought it was spoiled? Like, are you spoiled? Question mark. Then it's rotten! Exclamation point. No, because the idea is, it's been spoiled. But is it rotten? Oh, yeah. No, I've been writing it wrong. <laughs> That's okay. I've, I've written it wrong myself much a more of emphasis times. on right? the latter I noticed. Part. Yeah. I noticed that you did that on your, on your post. Uh, yeah. And it felt very uh, powerful. It, it implies that I didn't like the experience with this movie that <laughs> we're about to talk about, right? A bit, yes. <laughs> I, I'm sorry that that was uh, that that was conveyed. It's been a long time since I've seen this movie. There's a lot of water in it. Oh, so much water! And it's John Cusack. I like John Cusack. I had a good time. John Cusack, James Mangold, James. We like James Mangold. Yeah, we do like James Mangold. Yeah. What do you think this was your pick for the Spoiled Rotten series? And so tell me tell me what you think of it. Well, it's interesting because, you know, we had this this idea for the series presented to us by Ben Lott, one of our listeners. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, we thought it was a fun idea to do these twist endings. And of course, you know, you and I, I don't know, I feel like once a year or twice a year, we always like doing a, a, a short two episode series where we surprise each other with our picks. This was the one that we were wanting to do this go around. As soon as I started thinking about what film I would pick, like this was the first film that popped into my head because I think it's just it's such a uh, I don't know. I don't know if bonkers is the right word, but it's it's a film that really is wholly invested in itself. Like it, it's you have to buy into it to really kind of go along for the ride. And I went along with it when I first saw it in theaters. I was like, wow, that was a great twist ending. I, I really liked the the way that it played. I don't recall if I ever watched it again, but on rewatch this time and knowing how things were going to play out, I found it still very effective. I mean, is it something that I really buy into? Is this is this a world where I am convinced that something like this could really happen? Not necessarily. And and when you think about like how the whole twist plays, does it really lead to anything, any big discovery or anything that changes things too much? Not really. But you know what? I still just have such a fun time. I think James Mangold, he went into this. It feels like he went into this wanting to make just a taut, fun, thrilling ride. And and he delivered. And I still find it that way. So I, yeah, I had a great time rewatching this one. What about you? I really enjoyed my time with this. And I, 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 I was kind of clocking when I figured everything out again. You know, I'd seen it before. I remembered kind of vaguely what was going on and I knew kind of where things were going to be. So I kept trying to think, when am I going to, when am I going to figure out 
the the nemesis is you know like the the assorted um ill doers in the movie knowing almost immediately when Ray Liotta shows up I'm like oh yeah of course Ray Liotta was cast in this movie he's awful <laughs> Like, you know, like it was almost not even the twist that gave it away. It was the casting that gave it away and uh, that just everything comes flooding back as soon as I see Ray Liotta on screen. That's funny because I don't recall thinking about him in that way. Like for me, Ray Liotta isn't the twist at all, although I like the way that the story twists to kind of give you that reveal. Mm -hmm. It was the reveal of the kid at the very, very end. And, uh, you know, we should say this this series is very much about twist endings and, and yeah. spoilers. We're totally spoiling this. I mean, we always have. Oh, yeah. We always it's have spoiled. on this show. It's the nature of our show. But right out of the gate, the kid did it. And <laughs> the kid is the and the fact that it's all personalities inside Malcolm Rivers head. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that's kind of a another twist that we have at the end that, oh, they're not people at this motel, right? Yeah, that that really is. That's that's the big twist. I even said my my wife and, and daughter were standing behind the couch and they were watching, you know, I think it was the John C. McGinley um, <laughs> uh, crash. I like how you say that, like, were they scared? And so they were standing behind the couch or were they passing by? <laughs> I actually, they were literally passing by and they stopped and stalled and both of them were kind of watching what's going on. And then John C. McGinley gets crushed and um, they both are, are upset. And I, and, and I said, wait, do you see? Because they do the cutaway to Timmy. And, and I said, uh, you're not going to believe it. The kid did it all. And they both laughed and they were like, <laughs> yeah, whatever. Let's go do laundry. And they left. And then my daughter comes back in right as we get the reveal of Timmy with the with the gardening implement at the end in the orchard. And uh, and I got to experience she didn't watch any of the other the rest of the movie, but I got to experience the shock twist when she says, oh, my God, I hate you. <laughs> it was Timmy. Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. And yeah. it's funny because my I watched it with my daughter, who's at that age where she's just starting to get into films that have a little bit of a scare, you mm -hmm. know, so she really enjoyed watching this with me. But it's funny because the film doesn't hide the fact too much that it's Timmy. Like, you know, there were points in the film where he goes into the other room and then all of a sudden mom's dead mm -hmm. or things like that. And my daughter totally picked up on that. She's like, wait a minute, where did he go? I bet the kid's the one who's doing it. I like think she just, kids, she, kids yeah. see evil in other kids. <laughs> so they can I tell. think they really do. He's got dead eyes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that that is that the whole premise is that and, and the way the twist is uh, the, the tw psychiatric twist is revealed, um, I think, is pretty good. That we have this whole, it, it does legitimately feel like two completely separate storylines that we get to kind of experience as they start to come together. When we meet, um, we meet Malcolm Rivers, uh, the, the Pruitt Taylor Vince, um, character is, you know, strapped down and he's being led down the hall for this late night emergency backroom trial to discuss the stay of execution. And those all of those mechanics feel completely separate, the Alfred Molina side and the the motel side. And I really like the way those two things happen side by side. I think for someone who hasn't seen the movie, you know, if you don't know what kind of twisty twist this is, I think that's that's effective. That worked really well for me. Well, and, and so that's a, that's one of my questions that I have, like, how well does it work? Because at the very beginning of the film, once you've seen it, you're seeing, you're listening to tape recordings of Pruitt Taylor Vince's voice talking in his character with, uh, with Alfred Molina, his uh, psychiatrist. You're hearing some of that happen. You are seeing some photos. You have actual photos of Pruitt Taylor Vince along with a bunch of other images and stuff like that. And so there, if you know kind of what's going on, you have a sense, oh, so he's the patient, which you don't necessarily know who all this is that you're looking at at the very beginning. Because then what happens is, as you have these two stories, you have this late night at the motel as people are being picked off one after another, and then you have this late night trial as they're waiting for a prisoner to show up. We never see the prisoner. Every time we see them dealing with the prisoner, it's always shots of feet, handcuffs on the wrist, stuff like that, or things like that. So we're thinking, oh, is it is Jake it Busey? Uh, Jake Busey, right, is in, and Ray Liotta is trying to get him mm -hmm. there on time for this whole thing. 
And so it's an interesting setup because you, you're you kind of looking at it like that. And so it makes me wonder, how well does that end up holding up? Because then we have this reveal, oh, it was Pruitt Taylor Vince all along. It wasn't. It wasn't this other guy. Does that, I mean, does that seem like... um the first of too many twists or does that seem like it like did that bother you at all or does that still just kind of work as just more just a surprise i think just at a very high level the the thing that plagues this movie is the setups and payoffs that are unpaid off right the setups it's it's full of great setups and payoffs and i actually think the the jake Busey and ray liotta um setup that they are that ray liotta is the law enforcement officer and he's trying to get jake Busey to this place on time for this trial is a great setup and the payoff is awesome that it turns out ray liotta was actually the a criminal and was in the backseat of the car and they actually killed the guy that was fantastic the reveal of him putting the shirt on and you see that like the bloody stain in the hole on, on his back like that was something that i i thought was so effective like whoa what right. is going on here fantastic right moment there yeah. so effective that was fantastic the the fact that we have this character who keeps a uh, uh, jenny's character who keeps trying to talk to us about the burial ground that they're on <laughs> is completely not paid off like not even not a whisper all. it is really bad like why do we have a setup for that so that that's the plague of this movie it's the little paper cuts of things that they set up in this movie and don't pay off and to the degree i think that the psychiatric twist is satisfying may be a salve for some of those things that the brain is a fragile place we don't really know all the things that he's concerned about all the distractions that he's facing because of all these competing identities that are all dealing and and struggling together like i i think you can write those things off because of the chaos that they are painting in his head but uh, my expectation as a member of the audience is those things need to be paid off right and and it, it kind of I don't know that that hurt my view of this movie this time. Yeah, I, I don't think it hurt my view of the film, but it certainly became something that I kept noticing, like these things that were brought up that never were dealt with. Yeah. And it's like, because and I think that some of it is because they're trying to find ways to make the mystery make more sense in your head, like by bringing up the fact that there's this tribal burial ground, then you're going, oh, is that why they can't leave? Because we see the prisoner running through the kind of through, through the desert trying to escape, sees another place, goes to it only to find out that he's back in the first place. So we've got that set up. We've got the fact that the bodies all start disappearing. All these odd things that keep happening that, you know, I suppose that we're supposed to go, oh, maybe there it, it is haunted. Maybe there is some something going on here otherworldly that's keeping them from escaping and to that end it feels very um I, I guess the setups feel like they're just ideas to give us like a sense as to what could be happening and so it doesn't bug me too much because it's them trying to figure it out and so you know i end up buying into that that they're confused but we find out why because they just don't know that they're actually personalities in the head but i think isn't that part of that is i think one of the intentional twists that we want to uh, to stop and imagine for a minute that this is a um a supernatural story and yeah. not a psychological one. And that, in yeah. fact, is another twist. And I think, too, I think when you think of some of the criticism of the movie, that might be at the root of it, that sure. you you make a promise up front that it's one kind of movie and you don't deliver on that. That's that's not paid off. Um, to me, it works. It, the reveal itself of the psychiatric twist, when we have the faces switching back and forth between um, Pruitt, Vince and John Cusack, um, that's the first time I I just question, and, and this may be, this is down to like micro editing choices. Is that reveal effective between those faces? When the faces are switching back and forth, did you ever stop and think, wait a minute, why are they, what are they trying to show me here? Who am I looking at? Who are these guys looking at in the room? Um, it, it's one of those things that brought me out of the movie a little bit, thinking, why did they choose to use John Cusack's face here in this cut, and one look away, they use Pruitt Taylor Vince. I was confused. 
I wasn't confused at all because, or I, I should say, I was confused, but that was a moment where I felt it was purely intentional confusion on the filmmaker's part because they're trying to, you know, the goal in any story like this is you always want, the filmmakers always want to stay ahead of the audience because you never want the audience to be steps ahead of you. I think that they succeed in some elements here, they fail in other elements here. I found that very effective because it, they were ahead of me and I'm like, oh, wait, what's going on? Why is, why is, you know, he's seeing this? And then I'm like, oh my God. And well, like once you figure it out, oh, he's actually a personality in here like that was to me a great reveal i loved the way that it played i love the the way that john cusack's reactions were in that particular scene when he looks at the mirror and he sees pruitt taylor vince's face all of that stuff i found really effective and so all of the lead up to get us there really worked for me like that made complete sense and, well, and, and i'm I, happy I, with all of that i mean i get it and i told I, obviously i get your point about needing to stay ahead i felt like i was uh, getting ahead of james mangold in that case and i wanted to have a, a more concrete reveal that of, of who john cusack's character was looking at and i thought the looking at the reflection in the window was so effective but we've already had two flipbacks of pruitt taylor vince to john cusack and it lost some of that impact on me. And that's why I talk about those micro editing choices, like which face are we showing in which cut? I think it could have been a stronger face reveal and it would have had a, a better impact on, on me. In fact, just like holding it a little bit longer through that scene. And I'm totally armchairing a movie that is, you know, 18 years old. But um, I just I wanted this. This was to me, it was a little bit of, of uh, you know, grabbing that sort of visual um, bone too early in that scene. That's all. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I didn't have that issue. But yeah, I mean, I think that's, it's going to be one of those things where it's a, when did, when did it click in your yeah. head? You yeah. know, and so I think it's going to be different for every person. But I mean, yeah, I, I think that for me, it worked. But there are other elements where it didn't work as well. Like, I also will say, you know, the the boy always seemed a little suspicious to me, you know, it seemed a little creepy something strange going on there yeah the so moment you things... see that he's dressed exactly like john c mcginley nobody dresses like john c mcginley that was weird <laughs> john c mcginley what an interesting character like mm -hmm. i've never seen him play such like such kind of a specific character he felt like there was a clear like affectation with the character just the way that he behaved i thought that was really interesting i did have a question and this is something that when you do start thinking about this in context of all of these 10 or 11 people technically being personalities in Malcolm Rivers head. My question became, as I started thinking about this, I'm like, wait a minute. So he has two personalities that just got married. He has a, a trio of personalities of a mother, son and stepfather, mm -hmm. you know, like it, it seemed weird to me. Like when you think of like split personality disorder, and again, I'm not, a not an expert on this by any stretch of the imagination. My experience is largely in films. But when you look at something like Split, these personalities might be aware of each other, but they're not like, you know, like in Split, Getting you didn't married. have Kevin <laughs> hanging out with Hed Hed Hedwig, Hedwig, you know, right. like they weren't like buddies at the park. Because I'm like, how does how does Malcolm Rivers do that in his head? Like he's got one character where he's like the wife and then he's the husband. And it's like, it's like, okay, it just. It broke me a little bit as I started to think about these people actually being and then like, OK, and here's another moment was the detective who was driving the two criminals. Was he an, a 12th character in his head who was killed off early? And if yeah. so, was that it wasn't how the do we justify a weird backstory <laughs> flashback <laughs> or the or the, or the guy that Paris was sleeping with and putting the whipped yeah. cream on his chest? Yeah. Was that another uh, that is these are all great questions. And I would just ask you, <laughs> there is a point in the the boardroom where Alfred Molina, the Dr. Malik, says this person, uh, Malcolm Rivers, is undergoing an incredibly advanced psychiatric treatment. Right. And they try to wave it off with 
mind science. And it's like a one-liner. It's a one-liner toss-up. But I think that one-liner is carrying a lot of weight for everything else that happens at the motel and those flashbacks. I Do you think, I mean, I feel like that's what they're, they're, they need that. They need him to say that to give credibility to all the stuff that we immediately think can't trust once the twist is revealed. I think you're right because it really is boil. It boils down to he's on a, an experimental uh, like medication that forces his identities to come together and reduce to one like that. Yeah. That's basically how they how they write it off. And there's a and reason you general public don't know about this. It's because it's so advanced. Right, right, yeah. right. And you know what? You're right. It's But that's the sort of thing that you get in film and storytelling. And it works in science fiction, it works in all yeah. sorts of things. Yeah. It's like this is the thing that does that one thing that we needed to do for right. <laughs> to move our story forward. Right. Sure. OK. Hello, I'll totally hyperspace. Buy into this. <laughs> right. Exactly. I'll totally buy into this. Sure. Whatever. It's a, it's a new medical ahead of its time medical treatment that yes. allows for this breakdown of personalities to happen to to get this character down to the one sure whatever yeah. it takes whatever yeah. it takes to tell this story i'll take it yeah yeah um i do want to though talk about like stepping back just a, a bit from from mind science um when you think about each of the characters of the 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 personalities and what they need to deliver to the story they don't all seem to have equal value to me. Do they to you? Like, are you interested in all of their stories? I'm looking at you, Jenny and Lou. What I appreciate about the film is that they actually deliver, for, for me, all of these characters actually had something to do. It wasn't 10 characters who just felt like, why is this particular person here? Like, I never felt like that. Jenny and Lou weren't necessarily my favorite characters, but I thought it was an interesting kind of an interesting couple to have as a part of this. And they actually, there was something going on and they were hiding things and like everybody felt like there was something more going on with their character. And I appreciated that because it felt like the screenwriter had actually invested time to come up with something going on with all of these characters. Mm -hmm. And, and that made me happy. So it may not, I mean, they're lower on the totem pole as far as my characters I'm actually interested in. But still, I, I felt like I knew who they were. And I think that's important in a film like this. I Yeah, I get it. I, I get it. And I think those are the, these are the two that, that sort of don't sort of cross that low bar. But it actually brings up another potential criticism of the film, which is uh, this action beat, like the horror beat that we get when Ginny is in the bathroom, locked in the bathroom, and Lou is being murdered outside. He's already angry and been pounding on the door. And we've seen those cutaways where we get both sides of the door. And then we're just inside the bathroom and there is crazy pounding on the door. And later it is revealed that, in fact, at that time, uh, Ginny was locked in the bathroom and Timmy was in the room with this adult man and was stabbing him uh, crazily. Crazily, crazily. The sounds to me of pounding on the door, Ginny opened the door, don't line up with the uh, action that I, in my head that was actually, we find out later, was going on. And so it makes me treat those characters with even less credibility. Like that action sequence just didn't, it, it, was, a, it was a particular low point in a movie that I think otherwise I bought into. So what are you not buying into? The fact that you you didn't buy that it was Timmy who could be doing all this or what? Well, I didn't buy I didn't buy that it was Timmy. I obviously, do I buy that it was mind Timmy who probably has super mind powers because he doesn't really exist? Yeah, I mean I get it. These are characters who are destroying each other. But the thrill of that sequence was low to me. It was telegraphed. It was I didn't I don't feel like the sound that they had banging on the door lined up with what what my expectation would have been. And so the reveal was not it wasn't great. And it should have been like that's a that's a really intense experience. And I think having 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 the uh, like power of the murder behind the door could have been really great. And I just I wanted to know if you uh, it sounds like you didn't have a problem with it at all. No, I didn't. I, I I thought it was fine. You know, I I didn't I didn't think anything of it as it was happening. I mean, it's something I've seen before. It was nothing mm -hmm. new, um, but it didn't it didn't disappoint me like or let me down because they didn't quote do it right or anything like that. I I thought it worked fine. 
well, I think you said it. Like, it's it's nothing new. We've seen it before. So I got it. You know, I mean, and that's that's an old trick going all the way back to yeah. things like The Haunting, where, you you know, the, the sound is the thing. And, you know, you're not seeing what's actually happening. And so, yeah. Um, but yeah, it didn't bug me. All right. Everybody else I, I really quite liked. And, and all the other reveals I quite liked. I loved the mechanic of the keys. I thought that was really cool. It's a throwback to what I, I guess is inspiration for this film, which is, uh, Agatha Christie's Ten Little Indians. And then there were none other horrible I, names of that property. I, I, there's like a faint whiff that this is connected somehow to that. I don't know if it's faint. <laughs> it feels pretty, pretty whiffy. Uh, I, I think that there's a, a very direct homage to kind of the Agatha Christie type of um, closed room thrillers that she yeah. would write. And I mean, it, and, and there, when there were none, it's 10 people who come to an island. You know, it's that whole thing. They yeah. get a mysterious letter. You're invited to this thing. And then, of course, they're getting picked off one by one. And it ties into something from their past. And I they're not like in anybody's head. In they're not one, in anybody's though. head. That's in the that twist. One. They're uh, but it's the si- a similar sort of thing, you know, like. Oh, I believe if memory serves, one of the people who gets killed early on is actually not dead and is the killer. And, you know, it's very similar sort of thing that we have going on here. I felt very much like a direct homage. And I I don't think that I found any issues with that. I mean, Michael Cooney wrote the script. And I felt like, you know, he probably planned to have a sense of that. I, I And James Mangold has talked about how he very much uh, loved this sort of kind of closed room thriller and had been looking to looking forward to doing something like this because it gives you a lot of opportunities to really keep the world in its own little special place without opening it up to uh, all sorts of other things and i mean obviously we have we're opening it up to the court uh the proceedings that are happening but largely like the story itself is all happening here and and i i love that they kind of kept it to this and i i think that these agatha christie homages i mean i i find it very effective because it's a story where like they could have made it much more violent i mean it certainly is a bloody film and uh but it's not like slasher porn it's not anything that's that's taking it too far I found that there was a lot more of just kind of that fun psychological exploration as people are getting picked off and like what's going on yeah. and why. And that's what I, what, where I think that Mangold and Cooney succeed in kind of paying these homages to Agatha Christie because it really does build suspense. And I think, honestly, like our principal cast, I mean, regardless of what you think of, of Ginny and Lou, I think uh, Clay Duvall and William Lee Scott, along with everyone else, I think they're doing great work here. And like, I really had no problems with any of the actors fitting into this Christian type of world that we have. I, I think the thing for me to celebrate about this adaptation is that it's an adaptation that feels very much an homage to an original property and does enough for me to make it original in itself. I, I think, I frankly, I didn't need the psychological twist. I think what Mangold created here in terms of tone and environment and, um, you know, soundscape, apart from that hotel room thing, like it all worked for me already as a lover of these locked room kind of thrillers, right? I already am bought in just at the rainy motel. Like, I'm fine watching a whole movie with that. That they layered into it this whole psychological thriller and the the multiple personalities. That was stuff that, that I, I feel like I genuinely didn't see coming. It was a solid reveal overall and um, and I think does enough to help this thing stand uh, stand on its own. I I really enjoy this movie. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 the sort of film that I mean, a lot of critics hated it. And I think uh, Rotten Tomatoes, you know, they they do kind of a consensus after they take all the different reviews into account. And their consensus says identity is a film that will divide audiences. The twists of its plot will either impress or exasperate you. And I think if you go down the list of the critics and what they think, you're very much going to find that (laughs) is that some people found the twists to be completely idiotic and uh, unnecessary not actually delivering other people thought it really like that's what made it is that it was they they created some interesting twists that were a big surprise 
they went along with this crazy story from beginning to end and never never veered off the path of craziness mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and to me that's why it's a success i mean it's yeah i mean i there are these strange issues that you have as you think about it but when you're watching it's like this is just it's fun and and they're just they're going for it they're not afraid to just make kind of a bonkers film and mangle keeps it tight i mean it's coming in right at about 90 minutes and i i think that's just exciting to see I kind of can't believe how much they fit into 90 minutes, right? Like, <laughs> I, 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 even as I'm kind of exasperated myself with the Jenny and Lou backstory, I, that's a lot of backstory that they jammed into those characters. Amanda Pete as a prostitute, like, there, there's something about the character that I think is interesting, and I think she's wonderful. I don't understand why they, they have to make uh, such an ideological deal with John Hawks. You don't? Feeling so strongly about her. I get it. I just don't know that I, there's something about it that doesn't necessarily make sense to me. And I think it goes back to something you already pointed out, which is the interior, the, the, what we now know is a flashback to her being a prostitute. I don't see why everybody assumes that she is a prostitute without having the benefit of being in that hotel room watching her lick whipped cream off that guy's chest. I mean, that is a big issue I have. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I don't have an issue like with the fact that there are people who have problems with the fact that she's a prostitute. When you right. think of, when, totally you know, yeah. when you know what happened to Malcolm Rivers as a child and his mother was a prostitute and all this, that probably led to him having kind of these uh, multiple personalities. It all makes perfect sense. But I completely agree with you. It's like, She's not dressed that much like a prostitute. No. Like, you know, very light, like prostitute light is, I'd say, Pro- how she's prostitute dressed. Prostitute adjacent. <laughs> it, I mean, largely, it looks like a woman who's just going out for an evening at the clubs or something. Yeah. Like, there's nothing about her that screams, I do this for a living. And right. so that's that's an issue I have with just, like, they, they didn't take it far enough to give me a sense that, oh, you see her and you instantly think prostitute. Like, I never bought into that with her. And that was a problem I had um, with Larry and his reactions with her because he instantly goes there. I'm like, why? Like, I I don't know how you jumped to that conclusion so quickly. As much as I love John Hawks in this movie, and I really love him in this movie, especially when Ed is trying to kind of gently explain what happened with uh, Rebecca de Mornay's character and how she was beheaded and all this sort of stuff. Mm In a very gentle way. And Larry comes in and just kind of keeps interrupting in the funniest ways just to, like, spit this information out. I I had such a delight watching John Hawks. And uh, I think this was early early in his career where he started getting some bigger roles. And I think that this is one of those roles where I very quickly fell uh, just in love with watching him on screen. I love John Hawks. And I think speaking of backstories that work for me, his is great. The bit they give us that explains how he is at the hotel and the the mechanics that led him to become the manager of this hotel are fantastic. Well-deserved, well-written, tightly presented, great discovery of the old manager in the in the freezer that he just found dead when he showed up at the hotel and then he just <laughs> took over the job. I think that is so great and perfect for for John Hawks to play. I thought it was yeah. great. Yeah, I great, great, love great. that. Yeah. yeah. Something else that was odd to me and this goes back to kind of these story points that when you think about it, it's like why was that there? Like the tribal burial grounds. Yeah. We also have Ginny when the prisoner arrives, when Ray Liotta pulls up with uh, with Jake Busey in the car. Yeah. She's like, oh, does anybody else feel cold? Like, yes. why, why did that happen there? Because if, if the kid is the one who's killing people, like why? I don't know. I guess that was one of those moments that I'm in retrospect as I was rewatching this. I'm like, well, why is she why is she having that reaction here? Yeah. Uh, again, another one of those bits where her character just wasn't, it, it's almost like it wasn't finished. Now, speaking of her I don't character. Think, well, okay, hold on, hold on. It's not her character. That's just the writing. Like, they, they didn't That's what give, I mean. But it's not, but I don't think that has to do with her character. I just think, I mean, anybody could have said that line. They, and it you're would have absolutely been right, but they the gave it to her. The film. They gave yeah, it to her. but it has her. nothing to do with her character. Like, why would it, why would you say her character's not finished? Because I feel like they could have figured out a way to make like that assertion they did give all of the the supernatural stuff to her they gave it all to her and they did not finish those lines 
Yeah, they that's true. That's true. They, okay. It is her character underwritten. There is yeah. no other way to define that. And to a point, I recognize this may be a boob question. What happened to Jenny? Where did she go? She walked off around the car with Timmy. The car exploded. They never found Timmy or Jenny. Timmy later comes back in the movie. Jenny is gone. Well, she's the very she's the first of the bodies because after that, everybody disappears. Right. Where did we find her? We ne- we never find bodies again. Like the, all the bodies disappear. Anyone yeah. who's dead is gone. It's starting with her, starting with that explosion. So you think so? So we're to believe that they actually did get in the car, or at least she got in the car, yeah, right, and blew up. But Timmy did must not have. Cause, yeah, because later we see Timmy walk away from the explosion. Well, he yeah. like he got her in the car. I don't know if he stabbed her and then blew her body up to make everybody think that he also died. And it was at that point that all the bodies disappeared. Every single body. And then there were four or whatever there was from that point, because they go to the car and they're like, well, where's the bodies? Nobody's in the body and because then they go around the corner and like everyone is gone. Yeah, I think that is that's visually confusing, not having the experience, having set the film set us up that we're going to find keys and do all the whole mechanic. And then that she is the one that is the transition body. It again, it is just like a, a little icing on the cupcake of her being a quite literally unfinished character for me but it's uh, but they have to do that because if her body's there timmy's body has to be there and and we would also have to have a key for him and and if they did that then it would give away the whole conceit so from that point forward because timmy is now out of the picture like he has to make it where everything is out of the picture until that very last reveal with the key i get it i get what you're saying I'm not 100% satisfied. I'm not saying it, I'm not saying it's completely <laughs> logical. I'm just saying that that's that's why I think it yeah. plays that way. Well, I do think it's a funny line that a movie like this that is not completely logical but is designed to not be completely logical and still gives us opportunity to poke at it in in ways that I I think are <laughs> Like, uh, how could it be unsatisfying when it's designed that way? Well, it like there are rules that are set up that I feel like I I need to to believe in to get all the way through the movie. And for the most part, identity succeeds. Well, I think this is that point where we're having a shift. And I think this is where people, you're either going to be able to just go along with it or it will keep being an issue for you. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's at this point where you're like, well, something trippy is happening here, whether it's the tribal burial ground or they're in another dimension or whatever it is, something is happening here because uh, Robert, he runs to another building that's nearby, and it turns out he's back in the same place. So they're kind of trapped. And then you have this thing where the bodies start disappearing. Like, none of this is is natural. It's it's all, you know, supernatural. And so it's really setting up this strange supernatural story. All of a sudden, like, we hadn't had any supernatural sense. And then all of a sudden, it's shifting into this supernatural. And then we immediately, like, because they're, they're at a point where they're like, well, we have to, we have to make it very weird. But it has to be quick because we got to get to that reveal yeah. that it's all in this head. And I think that, yeah, you're either going to say, OK, I can I can get into the supernatural stuff enough because I know where we're going. Or if it just turns into something that's a perpetual problem, then it might be something. And I think this happened with a lot of people where they're just like it just it started making no sense. Like none of these things uh, were logical anymore. Yeah. What's your backstory with James Mangold? Like, where did you first come into him as a filmmaker i wasn't cognizant of james mangold making it being the the maker of the movies uh in like girl interrupted and kate and leopold like those i saw for different reasons <laughs> than i'm following the the trajectory of an early filmmaker um i i think it was probably 310 to yuma that mm. i i saw that movie and i walked out saying holy cow I need to experience more of, of that director. And by then I hadn't, you know, I mean, I, I took me many years to see Walk the Line. I didn't see it in the theater. So I saw it long after I saw 310 to Yuma. And, um, but I had seen these other movies and, um, and hadn't really made a connection to it. I actually never have seen Girl Interrupted or Kate and Leopold. The two how about, Co- started, how about Cop- Copland? Have you seen Copland? Copland is where I first heard of him. I, I missed Heavy. 
his uh, his first film a few years before. But Copland, I remember when that film came out, it had such high buzz because it was a really interesting script. It put Sylvester Stallone in kind of a, a, an interesting role that we hadn't seen him do before. And and it was incredibly effective. I really enjoyed uh, my experience with that in the theaters. And I remember kind of all the talk about James Mangold, this new voice in film at this particular point in time. And uh, he had written and directed every film up to uh, and up to this. This was his first experience directing something that somebody else had written. But I, I really like, like, I look through his filmography. I mean, generally, I really enjoy what he's doing. You know, I think mm-hmm. he's he's making a lot of fun stuff. My question is, when you look at his filmography, would you say that his films are what would you say, Mangoldian? Oh, Mang Mang Mangoldish Mang. Gold. I think. I think the D N is the, is the word. Man Golden. Oh, Andy, that's right. <laughs> yeah, Man Golden. It is Man Golden. Man Golden. I I feel like you you start talking about like the Wolverine. I, I know is controversial for any number of reasons. Visually, very interesting film. There is some really yeah. interesting filmmaking going on in that movie. Logan is fantastic. I mean, I just, I love Logan and I really love Ford versus Ferrari. I, I thought that was fantastic. Solid Super, film. Yeah, solid film. So I, I think in terms of a director that has great filmmaking credibility, James Mangold is Mangolden. I think he's a very fun filmmaker, night and day. I mean, I had, I had yeah. a blast with that film. Uh, and so I, I enjoy that he's doing these kind of stories with characters that I feel very authentic like i really connect with the way that he puts his characters together Mm -hmm. and now i mean i i've only not seen heavy girl interrupted or kate and leopold and now i'm like well geez i I may as well just finish off his filmography and watch those three i can't believe you haven't seen those movies those (laughs) two in particular like i don't know weren't you dating anybody at that time (laughs) i'm sure that's why i saw those movies i was took a date who didn't want to see my movies (laughs) yeah right i don't know i don't know how those ones uh passed uh passed us by but they did yeah funny feeding papa michael behind the camera andy Mm -hmm. what do we think of uh feeding papa michael you know, Feeding Papa Michael is one of those cinematographers who I always think does solid work and, and actually has been working with uh, with Mangold for a while now. And they, and they started working together here. This was kind of the kickoff of their time together all the way through Ford v. Ferrari and the new Indiana Jones film. So I enjoy seeing what they do together. I think all of the films look great. But then you see something like Nebraska, and I love what he's doing in that black and white world. So I, I generally really enjoy uh, feeding Papa Michael's cinematography. I, I note you didn't you didn't bring up the Monuments Men. I'm sorry, what film? <laughs> <laughs> Did you say the Descendants? I love the Descendants. I Absolutely. Said, are, are you Downsizing? talking about that Downsizing? that uh, yeah. that untitled uh, Matt Damon, Bill Murray, George Clooney vehicle? <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. But talk about a, a really like a versatile uh, a filmmaker, Feeding Papa Michael. I mean, to go from uh, Nebraska and then make some shorts for Nespresso along with that untitled uh, George Clooney vehicle and move into The Huntsman, The Winter's War. I mean, there that is a, a dramatic shift in, in tone. And um, I think he's just he's really terrific. The racing stuff in Ford v. Ferrari. I mean, that's a whole different kind of filmmaking to make those things intense and i think he's he's just great i think he's really great they're filming all this on a stage which blows my mind 95 yes. percent of this film was shot on a stage how much water they had, did they go through oh geez right it, um, but it looked fantastic like i i never felt like we were on a stage it all felt like we were you know in exteriors it just worked exceptionally and so to that end you know they they really created this world and and got me to buy into it completely loved yep. it me to 95% shot on stage. Crazy. What'd you think of the music, Pete? <laughs> I love the music. I, I actually, I really lo- I love the music. I, I didn't know that, uh, that this was a score that had been replaced, um, uh, from the, the original composer. <laughs> uh, Rarely I, do we. Rarely yeah. do we. Unless the, unless there are those, those times where the score is so sought after, like people are so curious about it that it ends, or the composer is so bitter about it that they mm-hmm. release it on their own, which yeah. certainly has happened before. But I, I mean, I enjoy the music. I think Angelo, uh, Badalamente, generally does great stuff in like 
David Lynch and, and like those sorts of uh, yes. projects, I enjoy a lot. Alan Silvestri, I mean, come on, it's Alan Silvestri. Of course, it's going to be good stuff. I, I think that he's generally composing stuff that that works well. I think some of his best stuff may be his work with Robert Zemeckis, but still, I think in context of the world that is being created in this particular film, this, I mean, it works really well. I, I think so, too. And I, it, it, mostly I'm just curious because I'm such a fan of uh, Angelo's work. Uh, you, you know, you talk about Twin Peaks, but so many other films with fantastic, moody scores that are just lovely and a, a real musical curiosity. I think the music yeah. here is fantastic. I also think that, um, you know, it demonstrates a real ear for the visual tone of the film. Like, I think it, it matches the rainy motel and uh, that makes it just really fun environmental piece. Yeah, really does. What about Antigonish, Pete? Don't make me say names again. <laughs> Can you say Antigonish? <laughs> is it is it Antigonish or Antigonish? Antigonish. Or Antigon Antigonish? It's, it's Antigonish. 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 Look how easy it just trips off the tum tongue. Trips off the tum. <laughs> Antigonish is a town in Nova Scotia, Canada. And there's a poem called Antigonish written by William Hughes Mearns, who uh, wrote this poem that kicks this film off and ends the film. It goes like this. Yesterday upon the stair, I met a man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. Oh, how I wish he'd go away. When I came home last night at three, the man was waiting there for me. But when I looked around the hall, I couldn't see him there at all. Go away, go away. Don't you come back anymore. Go away, go away. And please don't slam the door. Last night I saw upon the stair a little man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. Oh, how I wish he'd go away. Dramatic reading by Andy Nelson of Antigonish by William Hughes Mearns. He wrote it while he was uh, a college student at Harvard about a, I guess, a place in Antigonish that supposedly was haunted. And so it's a little bit of a ghost story. Um, but this is a this is a poem that uh, certainly has found its way into a lot of horror TV shows and properties. Um, in fact, in Fear of the Walking Dead, it pops up in there. And so it's funny that I, I feel like there is kind of a creepy sense to it that feels a little ghost story-ish. So I guess I can say I understand. Yeah, I understand. It's spooky. Uh, how did it do at award season? Did the poem win any awards? <laughs> the poem uh, did not. But okay. the film won one award, had 11 other nominations. At the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror, our Saturn Awards, it was nominated for Best Action Adventure Thriller Film, but lost to Kill Bill Volume 1. And it was nominated for Best DVD Special Edition Release, but lost to Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers Extended Edition. The Bram Stoker Award, it was nominated for Best Screenplay, but lost to Bubba Hotep. At the Golden Schmoes, it won for Most Underrated Movie of the Year. It lost Best Screenplay to Lord of the Rings Return of the King. It lost Trippiest Movie to Kill Bill Volume 1. It lost Best Horror Movie to 28 Days Later. It lost Biggest Surprise to Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl. And it lost Favorite Movie Poster to Lord of the Rings Return of the King. The Golden Trailer Awards, it lost Best Horror Thriller Trailer to Dawn of the Dead. Which, you know, I think makes perfect sense, because if you recall that trailer, it's got the fantastic Richard Cheese song in it. So, 100%. Yes, absolutely. The International Horror Guild, it lost Best Movie to Spider, which was a strange one, because I don't remember Cronenberg's film exactly being horrific, but whatever. Hmm. And finally, at the Teen Choice Awards, it lost Horror Thriller to The Ring, which makes sense in the world of teen choice. Did you, did you like The Ring? Are you a fan? I did. Are you a I thought it was fine. I thought it was fine. I had a but thrilling, you... horrific okay. time with it. All right. How about at the box office? Did it make any money? Mangold had an even $28 million to make this movie, which is about $38.9 million in today's dollars. The movie opened April 25th, 2003, opposite Confidence, and it runs in the family, landing in the number one spot. It only held that spot for one week, but it did stay in the top 10 for five weeks. It ended up earning $52 million domestically and $38 million internationally for a total gross of $125.5 million in today's dollars. That lands the film with an adjusted profit per finished minute of $960,000. Solid entry for Mangold and his team. I like that you picked this movie, Andy. I'm excited that we were able to watch it in our little, uh, uh, our little duo, our little pair of spoiled, period, rotten, question mark, films. And I would say now... 
spoiled exclamation point rotten how do you do that with an ex- with punctuation you don't you have to say not rotten You're right. it's unrotten. You say not rotten fresh spoiled fresh <laughs> I, I'm thrilled Stamp. to I'm thrilled to go back to this film uh, and find that it you know I think that it still holds up. I had a great time revisiting it and introducing my daughter to it, and she had a great time with it too. I mm-hmm. mean, just a, it's a very fun film. Oh, you know, we didn't even bring up the fact that there is an extended edition out there. There's a there's the theatrical cut and an extended cut. Do you know we which didn't version talk about you happen it. to watch? I, I watched the Hulu version. I didn't even know there was an, an extended version. It's only extended by a minute. And largely, is it a really important minute? Is it well, just rain? It's mostly there. There are two scenes that changed. Well, one was added, and it was very early on in the film where you hear the assistant DA calling the district attorney just to let him know what's going on. Okay, so that's that's the first scene that you have. The second thing is during the big montage at the end when you're revealing that Timmy was the one who was actually killing everybody. They're using a lot more cuts that are bloody in that particular edit. It's okay. only extended by, I think, about seven seconds overall, but they're changing shots. And largely, uh, James Mangold said it was a ratings thing. They had to bring it down because it was a little too uh, bloody on the initial cut. So the yeah. extended one just has the bloodier versions of things. OK, well, I should probably track that down. You know, I'm a big horror fan now. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> Huge. It's my jam. I love it. Shall we take it to the mat? Let's do it. Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel. You'll see all the movies we've talked about on this fair show. If you swipe over in your show notes, you you should be able to just tap the word flickchart. If you know, if your show notes are working, you tap the word flickchart and it'll take you straight to this movie in the flickchart database where you can add it to your list and see how it stacks up against ours. First up, we have Identity or the Girl Who Played with Fire. Wow. I'm going to say Identity because it, Stands on its own. Girl who played yeah. with fire. You really have to have oh. had dragon tattoo first. Smart. Makes it so I don't have to think. <laughs> You're right. Not... Let's do that. Rules. Identity or Fargo? Oh, you know. Yeah. Fargo. Fargo. I like to now think that Fargo, everyone is actually a character in, in uh, Marge Gunderson's head. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> Canon. Exactly. Identity or the Maltese Falcon? I'd probably put on Identity first. Yeah, but it's the Maltese Falcon. I'm not at a point yet where I'm like, you know, would I put it on first or not? I still have to go quality. So Maltese Falcon. Are we are we taking this one to the mat? I'm going to rock the boat. Wow. Okay. Here we go. Why not? I like that you're doing this on my uh, my pick. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. One, one two, two, three, three. Rock. Scissors. Eh, of course Falcon you're going to crush it. me on that. Of course. <laughs> Identity or the town. I'll say the town. Okay, the town. Identity or sword of trust. Oh, I just loved. Identity. I just loved that. You did just recently love it, man. What did I give it? What did we give it? Uh, three and a half. Three. three sword of half, trust. Three, three and a half. Yeah, you're making that up. It's the exact same for me. I gave it. I gave it. Okay, I'm gonna go with, um, identity. I'm going with identity as well. Identity or true romance? True romance. Oh. Yeah. Is that hard romance. for you? If that's hard for you, I can I can be no, swayed. I was at that line and yeah. I, but I'm true romance. Identity or being John Malkovich? Oh, being John Malkovich. Yeah, being John Come Malkovich. On. Identity or Dolmite is my name. Identity. I'll say identity. Identity or adaptation. Ooh, another film with multiple know, characters that know. might be in the mind. Adaptation, though. Yeah, although weirdly, I think identity is more approachable than I- <laughs> adaptation. <laughs> <laughs> well, that lands identity in spot 239 on our chart. 239 out of 516 films puts it at a 54%. Wow. It, this was a funny rank for me because it just went literally back and forth. I don't think I did any consecutive rank of the movie in any of the pairings. Interesting. Yeah. It's almost as if you had split personalities as you were ranking, Pete. I see what you're doing there. Mm. Shut up and tell me yours. I landed in spot 1143 out of 4659 or a 
Oh, it's even higher than mine. I ended mm. up at 432 out of 1511 uh, or 71%, according to the algorithm that Flickchart presents me. I should head over to letterbox.com slash the next reel, and I should give this a three and a half star uh, rating over there. That's what Flickchart says. That's not what I say. Oh. I think I think this is going to be a, a solid four star. Uh, and I think I can feel good about that. I think, waveringly, he says, I can feel good about that. <laughs> waveringly and, and, and a heart, I'm assuming, then. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're going all the Absolutely. way to, to the four stars. What do you think? What, what's yours? Are you a four I, star? Are you a five star? You're a nine no, star? No, I actually am a three and a half. But <gasps> I, I know, I'm surprised that you ended up jumping higher than me. But, know. you know, it's a three and a, I, I have a range of three and a half films that I just absolutely love. And I am okay with giving it three and a half stars because I, I well, you know what? I don't know. Now that I think about it, I think that James Mangold is be making such an effective film here. I totally buy into it. I don't know why I would go three and a half. I'm going to go four. Look at that. Look at <laughs> that. A I just, roller coaster. I, just I was about to just make a whole thing about this. how many decimal points are actually hidden in your ranking uh, <laughs> because you're, ra- you're ranking on such a razor's edge. Three and a half. Yeah, but it's 3.599 repeating is what's really yeah. going on there. Right. Uh, so not Too proud both. of you. That's good. Four, yeah. It's a four star movie. Solid. It's, it, I have a lot of fun with this one. Yeah. And uh, it's an easy, easy watch. I don't like the problems that we're talking about in here. I only really think about them, you know, loosely, like it doesn't turn into something that bothers me because I think that they're just making something here that you go along with the ride and you have a fun time. And, you know, if there are issues, you know what? I had such a fun time with it. I'm not too worried about it. So there. (laughs) You really told me. (laughs) That's what I'm here to do. What do we uh, what do we do next? Right. This is, uh, we're at a big point here, Pete. We, well, we actually, for members, we have mm-hmm. a, uh, a special members release coming during our July hiatus because this is the last episode of our current season. Then we have our July hiatus. We'll be picking up again in August and we haven't announced the new, se- the new season yet. So it will be a surprise, but we'll post it in uh, Facebook and Discord as soon as we do. We decided for our July hiatus, we we're going to do one member bonus episode. And we're going to release it on July 4th. And that is because, Pete, the film is Independence Day. Police and the fire departments are asking... It is morning. Stay off the phone. You wake up. Hey, 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 come on. You greet your loved ones. You grab the morning paper. And although it seems like any ordinary day, it isn't. For one extraordinary reason. A historic and unprecedented event has occurred. The question of whether or not we are alone in the universe has been answered. This is so cool. Four ships have just arrived off India, England, and Germany. I really don't think they flew 90 billion light years to come down here and start a fight. We gotta stop them! They're gonna kill us all! using our own satellites against us. The clock is ticking. We must launch a counteroffensive with a full nuclear strike. Over American soil. If we don't strike soon, there may not be much of an America left to defend. Being exterminated. Let's kick the tires and light the fires. We're looking at worldwide destruction in the next 36 hours. Oh, you can't hit nothing! Should we win the day, the 4th of July will no longer be known as an American holiday, but as the day when the world declared in one voice, we will not go quietly into the night, we will not vanish without a fight, we're going to live on, we're going to survive. Today, we celebrate our Independence Day.
That's what I call a close encounter. Oh, Andy, such a soft spot for this weirdo movie. Do you? <laughs> you don't? I, don't? I don't know if I have a soft spot for it. I didn't ever like it that much when I saw it. So I'm actually curious to revisit it. And actually, I am going to also watch the sequel just to see what they did with that supposed mess. So I'm, I'm very curious to come back into this world. Me too. I'm going to double feature it just like you. Maybe that means that Independence Day, July 4th episode, we should feel free to talk about both movies. What do you think? I think we'll call it Independence Day, but yes, yeah. I think that it makes sense to just, you know, just lay it all dig out. Dig into there. both. Yeah. yeah. No, go. I'm excited about it. That's good. We're going to have a blast. You're going to love them. I'm sure of it. <laughs> You're not going to love them. <laughs> Well, everybody, thanks to all of our wonderful members for all of your support. We really appreciate it. As a reminder, for uh, our monthly member bonus episode from June, Naked Lunch just dropped. And that was a part of our David Cronenberg series. We've had a lot of member bonus episodes. They've been coming out since last uh, late last winter, I suppose. And uh, so we've got a bunch for this show. We've got them for the film board and our monthly flick chart re-ranking sessions also. And those are a lot of fun. Members at the two reeler level get to vote on uh, what we're doing for our member bonus episodes. And if you're a member, you also get to, to jump in at the one reel level. You can go in and check out our Saturday matinee polls. If you uh, listen to the Saturday matinee show, if you like the uh, our, our weekend reverie, uh, if you saw me nearly get attacked by a spider on Zoom, mm. then you can jump in and, and vote for the series that you want us to talk about on that show and, uh, and watch live streams live. And let me just just add this. I'm I'm a little bit fired up about consolidation in the podcast industry. There's a lot of it right now. And I just want to remind everybody listening, we are an independent outfit. We are not uh, owned by anybody. We're not we, we just we're not plagued with advertising. We really are an independent group of people who just love movies and love podcasts. And, and we don't want to track you and your behavior. And all of that comes at a cost. And if you've ever thought, hey, I like listening to podcasts. And I sure don't like being, having all of my information tracked all the time. Uh, maybe the next reel is a place that you could uh, ideologically get in line with. We sure appreciate you uh, checking out uh, the nextreel.com slash membership and joining the club and uh, helping us continue to grow and thrive. We I, call to action. We can always use the support. Please, please, please. And thank you. And if you're interested in listening to the next reel and our shows but perhaps your feed is a little too full with all of the different shows remember we also now have all of our different shows with their own individual feeds so if you just want to be listening to the film board episodes or the trailer rewind episodes you can just go into your podcatcher of choice and you can just type in for the show that you want to listen to and just download those into its own individual feed and it helps you keep your feed cleaner if you're uh, overwhelmed with the number of of uh, shows that are all popping up in the next real feed now when the movie ends our conversation begins letterboxd giveth andy as letterboxd always do it the at the bottom of the letterbox barrel. There are, are people, a few people. There are I think, people. I think to the, to Rotten Tomatoes point, yeah. there are a lot of people who hate this and a lot of people who love this. Wow. Wow. There are a lot of people. that <laughs> I, I got a one star from Hagfishosaurus who says, I hate it until the little kid did the badass not looking at an explosion thing. <laughs> I love it that it's actually a one line review and Letterbox does say this review may contain spoilers, but it totally reveals the review. <laughs> Well, I've got a funnier one by Van, who says, if M. Night Shyamalan wrote this, even he would be like, wow, this twist is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, M. Night. Oh, awesome. Thanks, Letterboxd. It's hard to believe we've been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. You're telling me... Producing this show week after week is so much fun, but it does require a lot of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Your purchase is made through our links. Give us a small commission at no extra cost to you. 
and allow us to keep having these great discussions. We covered a lot of great movies that were adapted from other material in Season 10. Our Originals page at thenextreel.com slash originals is where listeners can purchase the source material behind all our adapted film discussions. It helps support the show at no extra cost when you buy through our links. In our foreign language Best Picture nominees series, we looked at several adaptations, including Z, The Postman Il Postino, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and Letters from Iwo Jima. We hit the high seas with In the Heart of the Sea from Nathaniel Philbrick's nonfiction book for our Aquatic Killers series. Eh, definitely a weaker entry in that series. I bet the book is better. Oh, me too. Member bonus episodes featured adaptations like Gone Girl, The Russia House, Ivanhoe, The Hot Rock, The Big Heat, and Naked Lunch. Oliver Stone brought not just original stories, but also adaptations like Conan the Barbarian, Scarface, Year of the Dragon, Eight Million Ways to Die, Talk Radio, and Born on the Fourth of July. Mary Heron's disturbingly insightful American Psycho was adapted from the Brett Easton Ellis book. You like Huey Lewis in the news? Oh my God, it even has a watermark. And of course, more Stephen King with The Mist, The Green Mile, and The Shawshank Redemption for our King a la Darabont series. Find links to all of these books and more adapted films on our Originals page. That's thenextreel.com slash originals. Every purchase supports our show. Get the full list of books that we've talked about and start your next read today at thenextreel.com slash originals. 